Good afternoon and good evening to everyone. I'm delighted to be with you and I'm honored to have been invited by the National Library of Israel to give this lecture. I'm going to be speaking about a problem of the Nazi period. Uh, it's based on research that I did over the course of many years in archives in Germany, where I came across evidence that members of the Protestant church, that is bishops, pastors, professors of theology, had organized what one might best describe as an anti-Semitic propaganda institute. It took shape in 1939 and continued in full strength until the war came to an end in 1945, when they sought to continue it, um, but were denied permission. So the larger question is, how do Protestant theologians come to defend Hitler and the Nazi regime with specific interest that they had in anti-Semitism? that is approving on Christian grounds of what Hitler was doing to the Jews, starting in 1933 and continuing through the war years. So I'm going to look at uh, the material that I, I gathered and I wanna just give you for a moment a sense of how I came to this topic. It actually began when I wrote a book about a 19th century German Jewish historian named Abraham Geiger. Geiger had written extensively on Judaism in the Second Temple period and also drew conclusions from that research about the origins of Christianity as a Jewish movement. I was interested in the reception of Geiger's work and uh, I discovered that in fact he was widely read by Protestant theologians. Now Geiger's argument was that Jesus was a Jew, a Pharisee, that Jesus like other Pharisees wanted to liberalize Jewish religion in contrast to the special aristocratic privileges of the priests in the temple. And Geiger's claim was that Jesus actually said nothing new or original or unique. He was simply saying what all the other Pharisees and rabbis of his day were also saying. So this was in the 1860s and 70s, and the reception of Geiger's work was not positive among Christians, among some Jews as well. Uh, who didn't like looking with historical method at rabbinic texts. But Christian theologians were offended that Geiger was claiming that Jesus was a Jew, a rabbi, said nothing new, you can imagine. And then I was interested in what happened, I wrote a book about this, and then I was interested in what happened to this debate uh, in the next generation. And I came across some material by chance in a library in Berlin, articles written by Protestant theologians in 1942. So in the middle of the war, the very year that the majority of Jews were murdered by Hitler, German theologians, what were they writing? And I started reading and I was appalled. I had no idea that Christian theologians would be trying to justify the measures taken against the Jews by Hitler. And then I noticed that this material had been published by an institute, an institute that I had never heard of, and I couldn't find mention of it except in one footnote in a history book. It was called the Institute for the Study and Eradication of Jewish Influence on German Religious Life. And then I started looking for information about this institute. Everyone said, all the historians that I consulted said, there's nothing, it was marginal, it was small, there's nothing left, there are no archives. But I discovered in fact, bits of material here and there in German archives. There was material in state archives, federal archives, in the archives of the German foreign ministry, church archives, also in university archives, because many of these members of this institute were professors at German universities. The material was scattered and I traveled frequently all over Germany, but I was always rewarded with something at every archive I went to, which is pretty remarkable. Now I'm going to share my screen and tell you a bit about the specifics of this. That is, uh, I want to tell you about their arguments specifically regarding the figure of Jesus and how they try to create Jesus into a Nazi, a supporter of Hitler, and say in fact that what Hitler was doing was precisely what Jesus would want to do himself. So the material that I'm discussing comes from a book that I published called The Aryan Jesus, 
Christians and the Bible in Nazi Germany. And uh, what I'm interested now in, uh, in the question that I want to present is the, and I can't seem to move to, there we go. I'm interested in how they came to this argument. Now, the slogan, let's see, first of all, let me begin here and say that there were two factions within the Protestant church. And I will add, by the way, that there were many Catholics involved as well, uh, but it's primarily a Protestant, namely a Lutheran movement. The Protestant church in Germany was divided into 28 regional or state churches, uh, and those churches themselves were in conflict with each other. That is, a Protestant movement began to emerge in the early 1930s that was very highly nationalist, racist, anti-Semitic, and wanted a manly church. It called itself the German Christian movement, the Deutsche Christen, the DC is the abbreviation that most historians use. They wanted to create a synthesis of Christianity with the National Socialism. They definitely supported Hitler, no question, but they wanted to go further and try to change Christianity to make it a Nazified religion. In opposition to this group, in 1934, there emerged a more conservative movement within the Protestant church called the Confessing Church. They objected to any change in Christianity, no change in Christian doctrine, no change in the Bible that's not permitted. They were not necessarily opposed to Hitler. They were not necessarily opposed to Hitler's anti-Semitism, but they were opposed to the German Christian movement. So that was the struggle within the Protestant church during the Nazi era. The slogan of the German Christian movement, which is the movement I'm going to concentrate on, was one people, one folk, or one race, one Reich, and one church. So very similar language that they use. I also want to note that the word Judentum in German can mean Judaism, but it can also mean Jews or the collective Jewry. It has an ambiguity and that's, that's significant uh, for us. The ambiguity is something that was in fact maintained throughout this era there. Now, I'll begin by just giving you some examples. And I, I can everybody see my screen, I hope? Uh, in 1933, this German, oops, German Christian movement <laughs> held a rally that became quite notorious. Okay, I'm having some difficulty here. The rally that was held in Berlin at a sports uh, assembly hall was really notorious because of one man, one of the leaders of the German Christian movement, Reinhold Krause, who said that the church has to be liberated from the Old Testament with its cheap J Jewish morality of exchange, so young, yeah, and its stories of cattle traders and pimps. So the first principle of the German Christian movement was to get rid of the Old Testament altogether. It had no place in the Christian Bible in the Nazi period. The Old Testament, they said, was a Jewish book. Just to give you a sense that even before Hitler came to power, this movement within the church was already active. Here is a pastor named Siegfried Nobeling in Berlin, 1932. And I emphasize Berlin because it's the capital and it's always seen as a more liberal place. Hitler was always a little anxious about Berlin, but nonetheless, the Protestant church had plenty of German Christian supporters. And he said in one of his speeches, we see in the Jews, the spiritual and physical poisoning of our race. And I emphasize this because I want to stress that Nazi racism was a racism of the soul, not only the body. In other words, what was dangerous about Jews was not, let's say, the Jewish nose, my nose. My nose isn't going to <clears throat> attack someone, but it's what, my, what is inherent or one might say incarnate in the nose, that is a spiritual degeneracy that characterizes Jews. This spiritual degeneracy can then infect the whole of the German people, all of the Aryans who were supposed to be the superior race, 
but who were nonetheless vulnerable to this Jewish moral degeneracy. So it's important. Okay, professor, the, the slides are all uh, minimized. So if you could enlarge one of them. The slides are minimized? Yeah, it's like a list of slides instead of the presentation. I'm so sorry. I don't know how that happened. Is this better? No. Can you see it? Hmm? No. Um, let's see. How about this way? Is this yeah. better? Perfect. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Thank you for telling me. So the first step was to get rid of the Old Testament. But that claim in itself became notorious and was one of the reasons that the confessing church was formed, because you can't change the Bible and get rid of the Old Testament. It was not an objection, in other words, to what was being said about Jews. Now, when Hitler came to power, there was a, an outpouring of appreciation for him from some of these Christian leaders. And here's one of them who was a notorious German Christian leader in Thuringia, he said, in the person of the Fuhrer, we see the one sent by God who places Germany before the Lord of history. We believe he has come for us as Christ. The identification of Hitler with Christ was actually fairly common. I could find many such statements. As an example, here's the enthusiasm at a German Christian rally. This is a Christian gathering of Protestants, and you see the beginnings here in 33 of the flag on the right that has a swastika and a cross. And that became the banner symbol of the German Christian movement. There were pastors who put the swastika on the altar in the church next to the cross. Here it's hanging from the Catholic cathedral in Cologne, uh, the swastika flag. So this mixture of Christianity and the swastika was not limited to the Protestants. This is simply um, uh, something taken from the Stürmer, which was an anti-Semitic propaganda weekly that was posted in every town and village and street corner in Germany uh, with very ugly um, anti-Semitic iconography, often with this kind of um, sexual uh, connotation. But here we see a woman, woman on the cross, uh, and the lecherous man is if he has raped her, is about to rape her, and so on. Now, what about converts? Uh, I'm sure everybody's familiar that there were German Jews who had converted to Christianity. From the Nazi point of view, a Jew converted was still a Jew because race law took precedence over baptism. And that became also a very hot topic among Protestant theologians in the first years of the Reich, which took precedence. If a Jew had been baptized, according to Christian doctrine, the person was now a Christian. But for the Nazis, no. And here is simply one example of the language. Just as a pig remains a pig, even if you put it in a horse's stall, so a Jew still remains a Jew, even if he is baptized. Now, this kind of discussion was not limited to pastors here and there. It also took place among university professors of theology. Paul Althaus from the University of Erlangen was one of the most important Protestant ethicists of the 20th century. And he welcomed Hitler in 1934. He said, Hitler is a gift and miracle of God. It's just one of many examples to show that this confusion of Hitler with God or Hitler with Christ uh, began right away and continued for quite a while. In 1933, I'm going to now focus on this man, Walter Grunmann. Walter Grunmann, who was a, um, a, a young pastor at this time, 1933, he called for the establishment of basically a totalitarian Reich church for the totalitarian Reich state, the Third Reich should have its own kind of Third Reich church. Now in this statement, he says, people have often asked in recent years if Jesus was a Jew or an Aryan. This question does not touch on the reality of Jesus Christ at all. Whoever asks it has absolutely not yet understood what Jesus Christ really is. 
We can only understand Jesus Christ truly if we recognize him uh, and should prove him to him as the miraculous new creation of the living God beyond all racial connections. Whoever wants to be a Christian has to have the courage to believe in a miracle. Now, I mention this because Grunman, who became the academic director of the institute I'm going to tell you about, and it was became a professor of theology at the University of Jena, Grunman was saying this in 1933, but changed over time and argued that, in fact, Jesus was an Aryan, and indeed, uh, he didn't quite say it in this language, but implied that Jesus was a Nazi, that Hitler was doing what Jesus had wanted to do himself. Uh, this is an example of a church in Cologne where the swastika was placed on the altar. I actually visited some churches many years ago where you could still see the shadow in the shape of a swastika that had been removed from the church at some point, either after the war or perhaps earlier. Now, another example of how the anti-Semitic liturgy or, or, or this liturgical rhetoric continued in the German Christian movement and these rallies that were held of pro-Nazi Protestants. This one was attended by 900, they say that everyone is equal before God, but baptism never made a Jew into a German, nor did it ever straighten a crooked hook nose. And I'll mention in this connection that many years ago, when I was a student at Hebrew University, I took a seminar with David Bankier, Allah Shalom, who was a wonderful teacher, and uh, some of you may remember him in Israel. One of the things that he mentioned in the class one day struck me and stayed with me that in September 1941, when all Jews in Germany had to wear a yellow star, there were some Jews who had converted to Christianity and who had been going to church every week and who then showed up in church wearing the yellow star. Now, these church communities knew these Jews, some of them sang in the church choir, but what David Bankier mentioned was that when a person, a baptized Christian wearing a yellow star, knelt at the communion rail, some of the non-Jewish Christians, if one should say that, complained and found it disgusting to have a Jew kneeling next to them. Some were asked to no longer sing in the church choir, to sit somewhere else separately in the church, or maybe to have a special service and not sit in a mixed uh, in a mixed setting. And you can see now, after uh, after I investigated this, I understood what David Bonkier was talking about in the sense that I can see the background of what led up to that sense among just regular Christian parishioners that even someone who is baptized uh, nonetheless remains a Jew and, for that matter, repugnant. I visited a church outside Frankfurt in a suburb that had, it was one of the few that had been built in 1935. And when you enter the church, there's a huge wall mural facing you. It's huge from floor to ceiling. And it depicts the scene of the crucifixion. As you can see, the Roman soldier looks quite heroic. And then to the left, you see, as the gospel relates, Jesus says that to the person to his left will go to heaven and the one to his right will go to hell. And so the mural depicts the man to Jesus's right as a Jew in the image of the Nazi era of a Sturmer image. Here's a bit of a close up. And here is a close up of the portrait of the Jew with the hook nose and the tongue hanging out, very repugnant. And that mural existed at least through the mid-1990s when I was last there. So people would come to church, sit in the pew, and look straight ahead at the pastor. And right behind the pastor was this kind of anti-Semitic image. This is the yeah, another image of Jesus going to heaven. You see the contrast of the golden Aryan. Now, I am uh, showing you this statement uh, from February of 1936 
by a man I mentioned earlier, Siegfried Leffler, was one of the leaders of the German Christian movement. He was both a minister and also the local um, uh, uh, Gau leader, the district leader of the Nazi party in Thuringia in the Vera Valley. So that's another question that's interesting. How many pastors were also district leaders of the Nazi party? Obviously he was a Nazi party member very early on, already in the 1920s. But Leffler in 1936 called a meeting of Protestant theologians, a small group who attended, including Paul Althaus, the great ethicist I mentioned already. The meeting took place in the city of Dresden. And there was a secretary present, a stenographer, who took careful minutes, and there's a long transcript of everything that was said at this meeting. I came to the uh, documents uh, because I read an article about this meeting that was published by a young German um, student, graduate student, and I was curious to read it myself. But what struck me when I read in the archive, the actual transcript was that this paragraph was omitted in that article. And that's important to me because of course, every historian makes choices. What's going to be included, what's, what, what you don't have room for in your book or your article. But let's read what Leffler said at this meeting. In a Christian life, the heart always has to be disposed toward the Jew. And that's how it has to be. As a Christian, I can, I must, and I ought always to have or to find a bridge to the Jew in my heart. But as a Christian, I also have to follow the laws of my folk, my nation, which are often presented in a very cruel way. So that again, I am brought into the harshest of conflicts with the Jew. Even if I know thou shalt not kill is a commandment of God, or thou shalt love the Jew because he too is a child of the eternal father, I am able to know as well that I have to kill him. I have to shoot him. And I can only do that if I am permitted to say Christ. Now look at the date. This is February, 1936. This is still pretty early. There's no decision made yet. No Einsatzgruppen, no death camps. And he's already talking about killing Jews in February 1936 as a minister and trying to give here a justification. And he what is saying what? He's saying, I can kill a Jew when I say Christ. You wonder, what is he thinking in this moment? But then I also wonder, why is it the person who wrote the article in which this transcript was mentioned said nothing about this particular statement from Leffler? It was omitted from the article. To me, this is a very crucial moment that he said this and that the transcript keeps on going and nobody stood up and said, wait a minute, what do, what do you mean shoot, kill? What are you talking about, Leffler? Including Paul Althaus, the ethicist sitting right there. There's no interruption. No one's upset. Oh, kill and say, shoot him and say Christ, what? So I was struck also by the fact that it is omitted from that article. And we could talk later about some of the things that are omitted from the historiography. So we see around this time, 36, 37, a shift, a shift in tone. The German Christian movement is now talking about Christ in this kind of language. Christ is not the scion and fulfiller of Judaism, but rather its deadly enemy and conqueror. This leads to a declaration from March of 1939 issued by the Protestant church in the town of Bad Godesberg, uh, which is outside the city of Bonn. And this declaration asks, what is the relationship between Judaism and Christianity? Is Christianity derived from Judaism and therefore its continuation and fulfillment? Or does Christianity stand in contradiction to Judaism? 
To this question, we respond, the Christian faith is the unbridgeable religious opposite of Judaism. So there we have a sort of inuche, the kind of uh, next generation, let's say, to the first book that I wrote about Abraham Geiger. Geiger, who sought to build a bridge to talk about the parallels between Judaism and Christianity. Jesus was a Jew, a rabbi, a Pharisee. But here we have 1939, the unbridgeable religious opposite. The Declaration also states very clearly that national, in that national socialism contests any claim on the part of the churches to political authority and makes the national socialist worldview appropriate to the German people obligatory for everyone. It carries on Martin Luther's work in the political philosophical realm and in this way helps us from a religious point of view to return to a true understanding of the Christian faith. So this is an important statement as well. So the Nazis, in other words, are carrying on the work of Martin Luther. Whether or not Luther would have agreed with them doesn't matter. In their minds, Nazism is a continuation. How is it a continuation? One of the arguments that they make is that <laughs> Luther was half-hearted. He went halfway in getting rid of Catholicism, but he didn't go all the way in get, getting rid of Jewish influences within Christianity. And that is what can be done now under Hitler. Most important is not simply getting rid of Jewish influences, but as it says, to return to a true understanding of the Christian faith. This means that these theologians we're not we're presenting themselves as those who really understand what Christianity is all about. They're not trying to do something new, dogmatic. No, going back to the origins of Christianity, because original Christianity was anti-Judaism, not a continuation. I mentioned the name of Walter Grunman. He was one of the driving forces. At this point, he was a professor of theology at the University of Jena, professor of New Testament and what was called folkish or racial theology. The University of Jena had the reputation of being a kind of castle of Nazi ideology. Uh, Hitler himself had appointed a professor of anthropology, Hans F. K. Gunther, at the university to be um, a professor to teach racial theory. And Grunmann and his colleagues in the theology faculty tried to bring racial theory to bear on the study of Christianity. And he became the academic director of an institute that was then founded in response to this Godesberg Declaration. Or one really what one should say is the Godesberg Declaration was promulgated as a kind of cover for establishing a de-Judaization institute. The institute itself um, <laughs> was uh, celebrated its opening uh, in May of 1939 in the castle on the Wartburg uh, mountain outside Eisenach in Thuringia, which is right in the geographic center of Germany. The Wartburg castle is where Martin Luther translated the New Testament into German. And it became a place for German nationalists and more for Nazis and now for neo-Nazis to gather. And at that celebration of the opening of this institute, Walter Grunemann gave the main speech. It was preceded and followed by string quartets. I'm sure they had something to eat. They had telegrams of congratulations sent by none other than Julia Schreicher and other figures, prominent figures. And in this speech, which was then published as the de-Judaization of the religious life as the obligation of German theology at church, he says the elimination of Jewish influence on German life is the urgent and fundamental question of the present German religious situation. Jewish influence on all areas of German life including on religious church life, must be exposed and broken. As the war broke out a few days later, in September of 1939, Grunmann sent a letter to the uh, Reich Minister of Church Affairs, Hans Carroll, in which he said the following, 
in a moment in which world Jewry and his hatred of the German people has struck a decisive blow and the German folk <clears throat> has been placed in a struggle for its rights and its life, referring now to the Nazi attack on Poland. <clears throat> I turn to you as the director of the scholarly work of the De-Judaization Institute, which was created by a group of regional churches with your approval. We approach the work of this institute with a conviction and you understand what's coming next. Jewish influence has to be exposed and broken. Okay. Um, the institute itself was housed in a beautiful villa in Eisenach. It was a villa belonging to the church where young pastors were trained following their academic education. Here we see also the shift to uh, more racial language in terms of Christian theology and especially in terms of Christ, the Christ figure. But essentially Grunman here formulates the problem. Our folk, which stands in a struggle above all else against the satanic powers of world Jewry for the order and life of this world, dismisses Jesus because it cannot struggle against the Jews and open its heart to the king of the Jews. So how can a Nazi Christian worship Jesus if Jesus is a Jew? Can't be. Please notice the kind of language that he's using, the satanic powers of world Jewry, or the, the term entlarved, the, the language that was used by these theologians was not classical religious language, it's Nazi language. And I emphasize that because I've had arguments with some German scholars in recent years who don't want to identify this language as anti-Semitic. In fact, including with a couple of British theologians. But to me, this language is clearly Nazi language. Here, we have something explicit. The Jews prepared the cross for Jesus of Nazareth, and it must be further clarified why the Jews everywhere were the most fervent persecutors of Christ and Christians. 1939. Now I want to get to the argument that was made that Jesus was an Aryan. And this, uh, this argument is highly contrived, of course, but it was acceptable in those days as a legitimate argument by many Christian theologians, if not all. Some thought it was nonsense, of course. But the argument is based on several claims. And it's a claim, by the way, that one can find already a little bit at the turn of the century. So even among reputable scholars, and I'm thinking here of Paul Haupt, he was a German Assyriologist who came to teach at Johns Hopkins. He was the professor of, uh, of Albright, William Foxwell Albright. So there were some people who, uh, who made these claims about Jesus as an Aryan who were mainstream serious scholars and others who were marginal figures. But what's the argument? The argument goes this way. Ernst Lohmeyer, who was not a Nazi, and who wrote prior to Hitler's coming to power, had argued that there are two kinds of messianism in Palestine in the first century. There is a Northern Galilean eschatology and a Southern Judean messianism. And he claims that the language that's used in the New Testament, calling Jesus son of man, for example, is not Jewish language, it's not Judean, it's not messianism, it's a different kind of eschatology, whereas Messiah itself, that's the Jewish messianism. Now he's not making a claim about Jesus being an Aryan, but he provided language that could be manipulated into justifying that Jesus was not the Jewish Messiah, but rather the Galilean expected son of man, which had a different connotation, so they argued. Now, here's a verse from the Gospel of John, chapter 7. But some ask, surely the Messiah does not come from Galilee, does he? Had not the scripture said that the Messiah is descended from David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David lived? 
and indeed. So this was the first problem that these theologians had to face. And the argument was simply that there was another village called Bethlehem in the Galilee, and that's where Jesus came from. But going back even further, the population of the Galilee. In the eighth century BCE, the Assyrians had, had conquered the Northern Kingdom of Israel and laid it waste, took away its whole population. So it was empty. And gradually, this is how they're arguing. And this is found, for example, in Walter Grunman's book, Jesus or Galilea, but also in other writings. Gradually, that empty Galilee was filled with Aryans. Aryans meaning people who came in, some argue from Iran, Assyria, different claims that are made. But these were Aryans, racial Aryans, not Jews living there. And then around the time of the Maccabean revolt, the Gentile Aryans living in Galilee were forcibly converted to Judaism, forcibly circumcised, there is wonderful scholarship on that question, by the way, by Stephen Weitzman, but I'm not here to debate the, the, the truth or falsity of the claims, but to just to tell you how the rhetoric uh, was developed in the Nazi period. One of the, one of the claims that's made, one of the most absurd is that Jesus's mother's name was Mary and Mary is a Gentile, not a Jewish name. So he can't be Jewish, which is, yeah. But the more striking and hardcore argument was that Jesus did well in the Galilee. When he went to preach in synagogues in the Galilee, people loved him. They flocked to hear him speak. And when he went to Jerusalem, he had nothing but conflict. Conflict with the Judeans, the real Jews, in other words, who couldn't understand him and couldn't appreciate him because he was Aryan and his religious message was not something Jews were capable of understanding. I have a few pictures of some of the participants in this. This is Martin Zasa, who was the Bishop of Thuringia where this institute was located. I want to show you here the town of Eisenach where the institute was. This was a deportation of the Jews of Thuringia in the town of Eisenach. But I also wanna say a word about what this institute accomplished. The first thing they did was to set up working groups of theologians and pastors and bishops. The first thing they did was to publish their own version of the New Testament, which was purged of all Jewish references, nothing positive, no temple, no Passover, and so on. Jesus's genealogy in the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew was removed. And a year later, they published a hymnal that was decorated with militaristic images. Here you see a soldier. There you see a Vartborg, again, soldiers with guns in the hymnal. Now, what happens uh, to this institute? First of all, in addition to the publications, and there were many, they published a, um, a catechism, for example. I wonder if I can, oops, I guess I can't do that. They published a catechism in which they declared Jesus to be uh, a savior for Arians. And they also uh, published conference proceedings. They held conferences every few months, either in Thuringia or nearby, but they also gave lectures and traveled. And what's also remarkable is that groups of Scandinavian theologians were given permission by the German Foreign Office to come to Germany and participate in these, uh, in these conferences and publish uh, their papers in institute publications. Just wanted to show you uh, an excerpt from the catechism that was published in 1941. Jesus cannot have been a Jew. Until this very day, the Jews persecute Jesus and all who follow him with unreconcilable hatred. By contrast, Arians find in Jesus the answer to their, okay. So he became the savior of the Germans. He proves in his message and behavior a spirit that is in opposition to Judaism in every way. The struggle between him and the Jew became so bitter that it led to his deadly crucifixion. I, the, 
yeah, the rhetoric is overwhelming at times. This is from 1942. The decisive German struggle for the freedom and life of our folk reveals itself all the more clearly as a struggle against the degenerating and destructive powers in all realms of life. Everywhere behind these degenerative powers, the Jew is visible. This is 1942, and I will tell you that uh, there were a few documents, um, letters that were sent by soldiers, German soldiers on the Eastern Front to members of the Institute, to Walter Grunmann, thanking them for their work, thanking them presumably for statements like this, from the Eastern Front, 1942, where they're murdering Jews. This is the formal title of the Institute uh, in German. Now, 1945, the war comes to an end. The Institute has flourished, actually. There was a paper shortage during the war, but the Institute had no trouble with its many publications, some more scholarly academic, pseudo-academic, pseudo-research, and some on a more popular level, announcements, et cetera. 1945, Walter Grinman was drafted. He was already in the military, and then he became a POW briefly, and he was replaced by another professor of theology, Georg Bertram, who pleaded with the Church of Thuringia provide funding to maintain the Institute. Now, of course, Thuringia was in bad shape as was most of Germany bombed, people had no money and the officials of the church turned him down on those grounds, no money. Bertram's defense was this, the Institute took up the fight against the Jews with great severity and fell as a sacrifice to it and it was the Jews who brought Jesus to the cross. What to do? Now comes the period of denazification. Thuringia itself fell into the Russian zone, but the denazification of these theologians took place on several levels. Those who were professors at the University of Jena, and it was a faculty of just five people, three were active, passionate Nazis, and that was Walter Grunmann, Heinz Eisenhut, and Wolfmeier Erlach. There was one named Gerhard von Rod, a famous Old Testament scholar, who was involved toward the end of the 30s with the Confessing Church, but who had been a member of the SA, I discovered that document, uh, in night when he was hired in 1934, which explains actually why he was hired since the University of Jena was so deeply Nazified. And the fifth was a famous church historian, Karl Heusey, who sort of um, went back and forth between the various factions and was politically quite astute. He was the only one left in the department in 1945. So those who had been Nazis simply lost their professorships and that included Grunmann. But then comes the next, stage, which is, could Grunman continue within the church as a theologian? Could he have a position at a seminary, for instance? Well, Grunman went to the church, and he also went to the state officials of Thuringia, and he brought his documentation from one to the other. The bishop of Thuringia after the war was a man named Moritz Mitzenheim, who had been a member of the Confessing Church. And he claimed that Grunmann stood in a struggle against the Nazi party, as only a few other courageous people within the party did. That I find nonsense, but that's what Mitzenheim wrote about Grunmann for whatever reasons. Even though Mitzenheim had been opposed, supposedly opposed to what Grunmann had been doing within the church before 45. But Grunman was able to take Mitzenheim's statement to the Thuringian state officials and present himself as a, an unworldly theologian who really didn't know anything about politics. And the Thuringian state officials concluded that he had waged a manly struggle against not national socialist ideology, a manly struggle. 
Grimbon himself had to appear before a uh, group of theologians from the Church of Thuringia to talk about what his activities during the Nazi period had meant. And he said, I ask myself, what exactly am I guilty of? For what was my life until now? I can affirm with a good conscience, dedication to Christianity. And then to the state officials of Thuringia, he wrote that for the Nazis, Judaism for, was for Aryans and has to be destroyed. As a spiritual Judaism, it poisons the German soul. That is, Christianity is Judaism for Germans, for Aryans. And that was something he had to oppose. What was striking to me when I looked at the archives was to see that denazification uh, documentation came by Grunman going to his fellow Nazis and asking them to write letters of support. And it was amazing to find, for example, from Lulu von Strauss and Torni Dictoris that she wrote this statement for his denazification request. I still think happily of the many evening conversations that concern the deepest religious and ecclesiastical concerns and questions. Even in those discussions, I did not have the impression that you were a fanatical disciple of National Socialism, but rather a scholar dedicated to the German spirit and faith. These kinds of letters attesting to, from Nazis, attesting to Grunman not having been a Nazi, these were plentiful in the files. Now, after the war, Grunman was in fact denazified pretty easily. He spent a year working as a pastor and then he was appointed to serve as a professor of theology, first at a seminary in Leipzig, in the Church of Saxony, and then back in Thuringia, at the um, Katakaden Seminar at a seminary in Eisenach. But during this post-war period, Thuringia was part of the German Democratic Republic, the DDR, East Germany. And I happened to find his file from the German, uh, East German secret police, the Stasi. And in the Stasi file, I learned that Grunmann contacted the Stasi and volunteered to spy for them. In exchange, for permission to travel abroad, for money, and so on. And he turned over to the Stasi his reports about other members of the church, including the Bishop Moritz Mitzenheim, who had been so helpful to him. What I found a bit ironic or amusing, I'll just say, in the Stasi file, one of the, uh, one of the Stasi officers who was working with Grunmann wrote the following. He said, Grunmann is a typical academic desperate for admiration and with an inclination to intrigue. I have just in conclusion photographs of some of these men. And as you can see here, Wolfmeier Erlach, who was a member of the Institute and a professor of practical theology at the University of Jena, has a pin in his lapel. And that pin designates him, and you see it with the others as well, as a supporting member of the SS. That is, a theologian could join the SA, and some did, like Gerhard von Rad or Heinrich Bornkamm, but they couldn't join the SS. You know, there was a special SS group for doctors, for example, but theologians, what did the SS need with theologians? So they became instead supporting members, and they received this pin to wear in their lapel, which they wore in their lapel proudly for their photographs. Here's, uh, you can, it's another photograph here of um, the same man, Wolfmeier Erlach, uh, hobnobbing with some SS. Carl Hoysey was the church historian who tried to stay out of things. And Heinz Eisenhut, who looks rather innocent in this picture, was one of the more vicious anti-Semitic professors at the University of Jena. Vinyl retired before all of this came to pass. He had been one of the more decent professors before 1933. And here we see Hitler coming to the inaugural lecture at the University of Jena that was given by the race theorist Hans F. K. Gunther. As it turns out, Gunther only stayed a few years in Jena, uh, but after the war, he published works under a pseudonym about theology, which I find interesting 
And I would love to find out if he had contact with these theologians at Jena while he was teaching there. This is a picture of Gerhard von Rad, the Old Testament scholar. And here's Walter Grunmann in the years after the war. He lived until 1974, a long life. All right. I have, whoops, wanted to show you one last picture that I find very moving, which is a picture that stands in a church in the city of Essen. It was a, a crucifix made by a young man who was very deeply disturbed by what Christians in Germany had done during the Nazi period. And so he sculpted a cross that's cut off, as you can see in one side, and the figure of Jesus on the cross lacks a heart and a head because he has been so deeply dismembered by these German Christian Nazi theologians. I'll stop here and I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you. And let me just say that if you, if you have a question that comes to mind after we've concluded this event, you're also welcome to send me an email. You can find my email address very easily if you just Google my name. I'm at Dartmouth College and you can write to me and I'll answer your questions. Thank you very much, Professor. There are many, many comments and uh, conversations and uh, questions here in the chat. I'll try to um, ask a few of the best. I'm sorry to those I will skip uh, their questions. But send them uh, to me. I will, absolutely. I'll send you the, the chat transcript in general so you can see all of the conversations that were going on here. Um, Gadi asked, he said, I have a question about the steps uh, the German Protestant church made officially after the war. We know that there are that there was uh, mea culpa and that and the reject of the previous anti-Semitism. Did the German Protestant Church cite and refer directly to these incredible Nazi theologians? No, they did not. So the uh, the immediate uh, post-war era, of course, was difficult for Germany. We we know that uh, poverty, hunger soldiers missing and so on. All right, uh, the World Council of Churches demanded that the German church on, on, a, on a national level issue a statement of guilt in order to be reaccepted as a Lutheran church, Protestant church back into the World Council. And so they issued a statement that's called the Stuttgart Confession, which was based on a statement issued in 1934, the Barman Declaration by the Confessing Church. And the Stuttgart Confession basically says we should have prayed more. But it doesn't mention Jews. It doesn't mention the Holocaust. In 1980, there was a statement from the church in the Rhineland that they shouldn't, they shouldn't missionize Jews any longer. It was somewhat controversial. And then in the 90s and later, there were additional statements but there's tremendous resistance to acknowledging the kind of theological antisemitism that I described today uh, and to somehow to acknowledge, to, res yeah, to express regret. And in general, it is taken to the third generation of theologians to talk about what these theologians had been doing and saying during the Third Reich. Thank you very much. Um, William asked, was Dietrich Bonhoeffer opposed to Hitler on anti-Semitic grounds, or was he opposed to Hitler based strictly on Nazi ideology of euthanasia? And what were the and what were Hitler's religious beliefs? Did he ever disclose what his favorite Bible passage or verse was? Hitler's, uh, you know, that's a controversial issue and. There's um, a wonderful German historian, a political scientist, Klaus Eckhard Bersch, who's written about a big, thick book about the religious ideas of the leading Nazi figures. Uh, that is nothing that would be explicitly doctrinally identifiable as Christian, but certain images, certain um, vaguer, implicit uh, ways of expressing that seem to have been present. 
the question would really be, and this is something I think that Uriel Tal also raised, um, Allah Shalom, that is, when religious Christian language was used by the Nazis, did they use the language because they meant it or because it was a good way to attract people to the movement and most likely um, the latter. And I think it's true in many totalitarian regimes, authoritarian regimes to this day. They use the language to make themselves somehow appealing to certain Christians, but they don't mean it. Uh, Bonhoeffer. Bonhoeffer was a very lonely figure. Uh, there's an important book about him named by Wolfgang Gerlach. It took 20 years in Germany for Gerlach's book to be published. Nobody wanted to publish it because he shows in the book how lonely Bonhoeffer was in saying to his fellow members of the Confessing Church, we have to speak out on behalf of the Jews, not only the Jews who've been baptized, but the Jews. And they didn't want to do that. So he was a lonely figure and I think very much a heroic figure. And it wasn't just about euthanasia and so forth. He really, Bonhoeffer really did care about the Jews. And was he was the best of the lot, one might say. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, Alex asks, uh, what happened to German Christianity after the war? How did Christianity find its way back to true Christianity? <laughs> I think that the churches have been suffering a terrible decline in, in membership and attendance. But immediately after the war, there was actually a boost in the 1950s. So people were devastated. And the 1950s saw a, a strengthening of Christianity. Uh, the, um, the kind of theology of Jesus as an Arian or that kind of New Testament, the word Arian could not be used after the war. That was clear. It was Nazi language. Some of the same arguments could be made, though. For instance, I, I don't want to go over to tangent, but I think in the scholarship on the Dead Sea Scrolls, it's very striking to me that a lot of former German theologians, Christian theologians who had been Nazis, became involved in Dead Sea Scrolls scholarship and argued that the apocalypticism of the Dead Sea Scrolls, and now I'm talking early 1950s, that that apocalypticism is not Jewish, that it shows some kind of Iranian influences. So it was a way of trying to find um, another method for arguing that Christianity was not derived from Judaism, but from, from Iran, let's say, from apocalyptic notions from Iran. It's obviously absurd, but it, it became a home for them. Uh, yeah, <laughs> there's much more to be said, but I'll stop. Thank you. Um, let's see, there was a, a conversation here, uh, a, a few comments. Ganit wrote, there is actually a Galilean Bethlehem. And Sarah answered her, um, Galilean Bethlehem was founded by German Templars, interestingly enough. Um, is there anything you want to say about that? No, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> I and see some did, hands up. Did you see this? People have hands up. Yeah, there's many, many. There are many questions uh, in okay. the chat room. I'm trying right. to uh, weed out some of the best. I Again, I apologize to those I'm going to skip <laughs> over. Uh, David asked, um, the Roman Catholic scholar Harry James Cargas asked why Hitler was never excommunicated. Do you know the answer to that? No, it's a very important question. Uh, you know, the question, so, so Hitler was raised Catholic, and the question of the Catholic Church, in some ways a separate question, it's more complicated in Germany. Uh, German Catholics had already been viewed with some suspicion as not being truly nationalist. Uh, there was some, you know, so there was a little bit of um, antipathy, a lot of antipathy in the, starting in the mid-19th century, and some of it was, had an anti-Semitic tone to it. So in other words, Catholics, Catholic monks and nuns were accused of having sexual orgies in the basement. There's a book about this by Michael Gross. Uh, but then in the, in the 20th century, so in the Nazi period, there would be the question of the Vatican excommunicating Hitler. And the Vatican established a concordat with Hitler and obviously was concerned with preserving itself in some way. But I think that that's material that um, belongs to a separate lecture on the Catholic Church. Uh, but no, the there was no thought of excommunicating. I think another problem, though, is why did the why did so many Vatican officials? And I got this also from my professor David Bonkier at Hebrew University. 
Vatican officials helped so many Nazis escape Europe. And uh, uh, yeah, why did they do that? Why was forgiveness so quick to come after the war from the Vatican? Forgiveness for Nazis. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Noah asked, did Christian organizations outside of Germany oppose or criticize the, uh, this religious German anti-Semitism? Yes, there were groups who supported and groups who opposed, uh, especially in England, there was opposition. And in fact, the voice of opposition to the Nazis from the Archbishop of Canterbury and other leading Christian theologians in Germany after Kristallnacht, which is November 9th, 10th, 1938, the big pogrom against the Jews in Germany. The opposition in England really changed minds. That is, the English had been very concerned not to get involved in another war. And the theologians in England presented Kristallnacht as an attack also against Christians. The synagogues were burned down, synagogues were destroyed, that's also an attack on our faith. And that was a very powerful message in England. And I think that's the, the best example I can think of. Thank you very much. Caitlin asked a question. Um, she writes, since there was never a formal acknowledgement of what had transpired among uh, pro Protestantism, how does this affect religious dialogue and tensions in modern day Germany between Judaism and Christianity? Many Germans I know are not educated about Judaism at all, but know a tremendous amount about Lutheranism. Well, that's interesting. Well, actually my, my friends uh, who work in this field in Germany claim that very few people these days know much about Christianity in Germany. And many people have withdrawn altogether from the church. The churches are empty on Sundays. That children come to school never having heard much about the Bible. Uh, so I don't know. But in terms of Jewish-Christian dialogue, there's quite a bit, especially in Berlin, of course, but elsewhere as well. And there are a few very devoted Christians, Christians who really have immersed themselves in this topic and who care very deeply about the anti-Semitism of Germany and the anti-Jewish uh, teachings within Christianity. They're really, really devoted. I think that they're and the people I've met in Germany who do this work are quite extraordinary. Uh, and I, I, I think they're better than anywhere else, even better than in the United States. So there is dialogue that goes on and, uh, and it's been going on. And again, I think it took the third generation after the war for this to begin to really take shape in a deep way, in a profound way. Thank you very much. Um, the last question that I'll read out will be, um, how has your work been received in Germany? <laughs> uh, 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 <laughs> so there are efforts to this day to try to defend these theologians, uh, to say that, well, they, to ignore the kind of Nazi language they use, or to simply ignore the years between 1933 and 1945. So here's an example. So Walter Grunmann was a, a student before 33. He finished his PhD before 33. He joined the Nazi party in 1930. And after 45, he continued to publish and he wrote commentaries on the gospels that were very popular and that were required reading for all pastors, anyone who wanted to be a pastor had to read Grunman's commentaries in Germany, in East Germany, in West Germany, in Switzerland, Austria. It's required reading well into the 1990s. And the question is, can his post-war commentaries be read and studied and admired when you ignore what he did by ignoring what he did during the Nazi period? Or does, do his Nazi activities somehow contaminate what came uh, after the, the war, his publications before and after. So that's uh, a debate um, that and we can, I think we each should be making our own decision about that. But I think the bracketing of what he said, just ignoring it altogether, not 
citing the language clearly and showing the kinds of words that he used to speak of Jews as satanic, that I find very troubling. And that's where I have arguments with some of my German colleagues. Again, thank you so much, Professor. Is there... Do you not want to take the two people who have hands up? Are we not going to? I, I'm, well, I will, I, once, I, once I'm done, I will open uh, oh, the okay. mics, but I, I have a very, very, um, I mean, some, some of the discussions in the chat were very uh, heated and um, I have a very, very uh, heartfelt request from all participants. I will open the mics, but please be polite, let people talk and don't be aggressive to anyone. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks again, Thank Professor you. and Laila Tov from Jerusalem. <laughs> Laila Tov. The mics are open. Hello? Can Hi. I Hello. Laila Tov. Hello, what's your name? Renata? Renata Jacobson, Shalom. Shalom. Toda raba. meot. Toda. And I see uh, Diana Lipton has a question. Well, it's really her husband, Chaim Malikovsky. Do you hear me? Oh, hello. Yes. Um, I hear you. Mm -hmm. How are you? Okay. Thank you. Um, fascinating talk. Thank you very much. And um, one text that is fascinating and incredible, the one that I don't remember the names, obviously, went by so fast, but the one where he said, I have to, according to my religion, I have to love the Jew. Yeah. And according to my state, I have to kill the Jew. And what do I do? And then I want to offer a bit different interpretation that I think is implicit of what you said. Yeah. At the, I, I would see why the person that published it skipped it because it's so hard to understand what he's getting at at the end when he says, all I can say at the end is Christ. And I think what he's saying, even though it doesn't really fit in with that much the rest of your talk, I think what he's saying is that when I kill that Jew because of what the Nazi state demands of me, I am making him into another Christ. And that's an incredibly, incredibly weird theological statement which has huge implications in it in the relationship with the Jew. And I think that's exactly what he's saying. And it kind of puts it very differently from the perspective that I think the, that, that, that is implicit in so many other things that you brought. Well, that's very interesting. I'm gonna take a look at the uh, original German. I'll take another look and see if I can read it that way. I appreciate that. Thank you. That's I it's just, it's, it's, I, I, was, I spent thinking about that and it's just incredible. It's just weird. It is. Anyway, very much. It was really, it was really good. Thank you. Thanks. I have a question, Professor. The, yes. uh, the origin of all that is uh, around 140 after Jesus Christ. Marcion, you didn't speak of Marcion, was the first in the church who wanted to cut all ties between Jews and and uh, Jesus, and oh. we read and we wrote the Evangelists by eliminating all Jewish places, and he was later condemned very quickly condemned by church by a book by Tertullian called Against Marcion. Right. Do you find the link here? Yes, definitely. So actually there was a revival of interest in Marcion and a sympathy for Marcion that begins already with a book by Adolf von Harnack. It was his dissertation on Marcion in the late 1870s that he didn't publish until much later. But yes, the claim that of Marcion is that the God of the Old Testament is not the same as the God of the New Testament and so forth. But these theologians really, uh, first of all, weren't interested in, in doctrine per se. Uh, and they were not interested in defending themselves via Marcion. Uh, and it wasn't a question of whether the God is the same God. They wanted anything Jewish removed. So I understand your argument uh, and, and it is a kind of heritage of Marcion, but taken to another level. Professor, uh, Professor Heschel, thank you very much for your talk. I have a question about the proportions. What percentage approximately of Protestant pastors belong to the Deutsche Christen and which percentage belong to the Bekenende Kirche during the Th Third Reich? 
Yeah, it's very difficult for us to determine because the membership cards of the Deutsche Christen were, were lost or gotten rid of. Uh, so we don't know exactly. And we don't know when someone became involved in the early 30s, did they retain membership all the way through the war years? We don't know. But, uh, and the, the other question would be not just the pastors, but also the lay people. Mm -hmm. uh, another question would be, someone could be sympathetic to the Deutsche Christen, a pastor, but did he preach in his church? Now, I did meet someone once in Hamburg years ago who told me that when he was a young boy of 13, preparing for communion or something, his pastor said to the group of children that Jesus was an Aryan and everybody believed him. There was no question. Uh, so because another issue with propaganda is always, and this is something that David Bankier worked on, we have the propaganda, but who took it seriously? How do we know the impact of the propaganda? And that's much, much more difficult to determine. And do we have numbers about the Bakan and the Kirche? Again, it's difficult to say, but, but again, I would point out something else. It's not just a question of numbers. It's also a question of who and where and who held what position. So as an example, by 1935 and certainly 36, all of the theological faculties, the departments of theology at German universities were controlled by the German Christians. Hmm. The German Christian movement, even if there was opposition, nonetheless controlled most of the regional churches. And then there were three bishops, three of the 28, who were called neutral. But when we look at what they wrote, it wasn't so neutral. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Sure. Hi, all. Hi. Um, okay. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask just how deep this religion goes up to today, and can you sense in a way this kind of thinking in higher hierarchy of people in Germany today? Well. Actually, that your question, one could answer in two ways. One, one issue would be how widespread is antisemitism? The other question is how widespread is this kind of religious or Christian thinking? On the Christian thinking, I don't think it's all that widespread these days. In terms of the antisemitism, hard to say, uh, hard to measure, but there, there, yeah, there are those who are very, deeply concerned, uh, but I think I would say what's important to me is to understand that there are institutions that are powerful in a society, like the German parliament, the German government, the professors, the intellectuals, the writers, the people who have influence over others. What are they promoting? And I don't think they are, they are not promoting an explicit anti-Semitism. I would worry more about sometimes little implicit remarks that are made, small things, a little remark, a little joke, things that are not so obvious, uh, but that may have nonetheless a small impact. We call it in the United States, a microaggression, something a little negative about Jews but person was, of course, I, I, my, I like Jews and so on. His uh, friends are Jews. That's kind of, yeah. I gave a lecture about this in Berlin once some years ago when a woman said, you know, I, I have a lot of Jewish friends and I go off into Israel and my Jewish friends are even more critical of Israel than I am. But I ask myself, where did antisemitism come from? This is how she spoke. And I realized that before there were Jews, there was no anti-Semitism. So it's really Jews who brought anti-Semitism into the world. And I, I thought I would go crazy at that moment, but she didn't mean it, but it was still there. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. Thank you very much. Your lecture was fascinating. Thank you. Thank you very much, so Thank very much. Good, good evening, Professor. Um, 
uh, from Belgium and I oh. read your book a long time ago, many years ago, and I really enjoyed it and appreciated it because I am myself Protestant and I'm also a pastor, so I, oh. I uh, have actually written my book, which is called The Failure of the Church Towards the Jews or in oh front my. of the Jews, in French, because we are French yes. speaking. Mm -hmm. but anyway, I had a question for you. By the way, I do uh, mention your book in my book. Oh, thank you. And the fact that uh, it is a very good work and it needs to be read by people who can read in English, of course. Uh, but I had a question for you. Uh, why do you think it took so long for the German church, the Lutheran church in particular, to acknowledge the atrocities that were committed and also the how can I say this attitude of standing unilaterally with uh, Nazism instead of standing with for what the Bible says, whether it's the Old or the New Testament? Do you have a reason and explanation for that? No, I don't have an explanation why. And I have to say that it is highly unfortunate. I do think that if Dietrich Bonhoeffer had not been killed by the Nazis, he would have been an important leader in the post-war years. But there were post-war thinkers who could have been forceful. I, 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 people who were forceful politically, Jürgen Moldmann, for example. Martin uh, Niemöller. Niemöller. Bart, hmm? Martin Niemöller also. Yes, Niemöller. I mean, what I actually found was that, for instance, Niemöller, Betke, Eberhard Betke, who wrote the biography of, of Bonhoeffer, once they started coming to the United States, they began to realize for the first time they were challenged about the Holocaust. In Germany, nobody talked about it. So they, nobody was asking them to say it was something. It a taboo subject, I think. Huh? Yeah. That's right. You were not allowed to even criticize or say anything that was against the regime that used to be there. Because everybody, well, the vast majority of Germans, whether the pastors or leaders or even the lay people thought that Nazism was the greatest thing that ever happened to the world, right? Yeah, yeah. It's very nice to meet you. Thank you for Thank coming. Thank you. Nice to meet you too. And I see Dave Woodhouse. Yeah, hi. Thank you, Professor. Hi. For, yeah, hello. Um, hey, listen, thank you for your lecture. It's been absolutely brilliant. Thank you. Um, thank you. I'm just toying around with a few ideas, really. I mean, um, all of what seems to have happened in Germany at the time that you're talking about seems to ride on the back of social Darwin. The, are, you, are you familiar with the German romantics? Yes. Moving, moving through the German romantics and into their, into their type of thinking. I just, as a Christian, I, I cannot see anywhere where those German Christians have got their ideas from. I mean, I would condemn them at that level. I, I can't. I really can't. As soon as they start talking about the language of Volk, the only thing they're missing is blood and soil. And that's exactly where it went. And Christianity seemed to agree with that at the German level. Now, I want to pick up on your, on your, on your remark about language. Because Five. moving, moving Five. forward into 2021... Yes, sir. Oh. And right now I'm Hello? going to close to you. Sorry, I've lost. I've it's lost okay. I'm, I'm here. I'm here. Go okay, ahead. Continue your question. Yeah, the question is: is where do you where do you see the future lying with the language that's going to be used? Okay. The future yes. of the language. Mm -hmm. Yes. In 2021, we have a lot of unrest in the world today. Yes. Israel is Israel is is a, is a big contender. Is doing well in so many areas. They've got their enemies. They always have had. Has the language changed? Because certainly Christianity has changed. So where is the language now going to be coming from? Is it going to be coming from inside the parliaments, inside the structures of governing of, of, of government, leaving behind the church other than the Pope, who seems to be doing his own thing? Where do you see the land lying? I'm not sure, to be honest with you, uh, where how the language is going to be changing. I do think that we find uh, today in young people a profound sense of, of justice and uh, a passion for justice. 
and a tremendous deep concern about the racism that's uh, just permeating everything. Uh, certainly in the in the United States. Are you you are you in England? Yeah, I'm in I'm in England. I'm in the UK. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, part of my part of my reasoning is this: um, history has a bad habit of repeating itself. And I'm sure at some stage the language will re will, will reemerge, but I think it will reemerge not through the Christian Church so much, but through different avenues. Uh, uh, I'm just trying to I'm just trying to think forward as to where this might end up resurfacing and how it might resurface. Well, it certainly has resurfaced in the United States with white supremacists and neo Nazis, who aren't necessarily reading German theology, but are making very similar kinds of claims. And mm -hmm. it's frightening. Uh, I, I, yeah. So it hasn't just, it hasn't disappeared. No, thank you. I, I, I see it was a, it wasn't really as much of a question as a statement as, as a kind of a thought process I'm, I'm going through. Um, yeah. But I want to thank you for, for giving your lecture. <laughs> It's Thank really good. You. Thank you for Bless coming. You. Thanks. Bless you. Um, Eduardo? One, yeah. One Thank you, professors. Hi. Thank you very much for, for your amazing, amazing presentation. Thank I'm you. a Latino. I'm a Christian living in Israel. I love Israel. Okay. And um, uh, for me, uh, one of the questions that I get a lot from my Jewish friends are why always uh, Jesus Christ has been portrayed as a Caucasian? And until today, my question was because it was uh, ethnocentric, uh, uh, you know, in some cultures, for example, uh, in Peru, where I come from, we have a uh, Jesus which looks uh, dark and in some countries uh, uh, are more portrayed, you know, it's an ethnocentric way to portray Jesus as, you know, every culture put a little bit of it themselves, but most of the time, uh, as, as we, I just show you a, a picture of, you know, normal Christian Jesus is an, uh, a white blue eyes. Um, what do you think will be uh, in the future uh, if, there is a, uh, if there is a place that we have portrayed the, the Jewish as a Semitic race, do you see, do you see that there is a value to, to put and, you know, start understanding that that Jesus was a Jew, and he probably would look like a like a Jew in terms of of, of race. And my, my second question there is that what was has been until now the position of the Catholic Church about this? It has been, I, I understand this is only Protestant, but it has been any statement or any advance in the in, in these terms. The Catholic Church, yeah. Um, mm. I have a colleague in the United States, Kevin Spicer, who has been looking at Catholic, Catholic priests, Roman Catholic priests in Germany who supported Hitler, some of whom joined this institute and, and actually had their own little Catholic committee, so to speak, within it. So there was in fact, uh, we're discovering just now, just in recent years, discovering Catholics who tried to do the same kind of thing. I guess I had always assumed prior to this that Catholics had so much doctrinal discipline, they wouldn't dare try to change the Bible or the liturgy, but apparently that also was taking place. The other thing I would mention is that <clears throat> I have a colleague named Robert Tobin who's worked on some of the neo-Nazi literature in Italy, uh, neo-fascist yeah, of recent years, and uh, he finds similar kinds of arguments there. And another colleague of mine, um, Jeremy Brown, works on Argentina, where he's discovered a literature that calls itself Aryan Kabbalah, uh, that's also highly anti-Semitic. Now, in terms of the image of Jesus himself, it's interesting that in the 1960s, there were efforts to portray Jesus as black in the United States, and also in South Africa. Jesus is black. At the time, it was considered a radical thing to call Jesus Black. Albert Clegg, who was a pastor in Detroit, published a book called The Black Christ, and it was considered radical. I don't think it's radical at all. Uh, and <laughs> there was also an effort to portray Jesus as a female on the cross. Um, so uh, 
I think this is something that we find all over the world, frankly, and I think it's helpful. I'm not Christian, so it's really not for me to say, but I would imagine that these expressions, which to me sound like expressions of devotion, Christian devotion, should be welcomed. So I, I, I see Bogdan. I, I'm not sure how to pronounce your last name. Yeah, don't worry about that. It's a 10 letter Romanian name. <laughs> oh, could you say it? Georgitsa. It's a Georg form of George. Oh, oh. Where, um, where in Romania are you from? I'm, I'm living in the UK right now. I've lived here for 10 years and I've lived oh. in the US before uh, while I was doing my uh, postgraduate studies. Um, thank you for your presentation, Professor uh, Heschel. Uh, I have a, a, a historical curiosity uh, you might know uh, about. Um, are there any earlier uh, versions of the New Testament that are trying to de-Judaize the text, mm -hmm. either in, uh, in, the, in the Reformed or Lutheran traditions or anywhere else? Uh, so, it, certainly in this period, that is, after 1933, there were other attempts. There were, in fact, attempts to revise the Sermon on the Mount because well, you can imagine if you say, blessed are the meek, uh, blessed are the peacemakers, I and mean, this is not for a Nazi society. Mm -hmm. So there were, there were new versions, uh, you know, and um, new translations also of the Gospel of John, which was a favorite gospel because it was anti-Jewish, you know, it said some very negative things, although it also has a very positive, salvation comes from the Jews in John 4, that's, you know, that's a problem. But uh... yeah, my my question sort of stems from my own interest in in um, uh, the first uh, translations in Romanian of the Bible in mm -hmm. the 16th century, and I was uh, quite uh, surprised to discover that some of the early translators um, replaced Israel, for instance, in Matthew um, with Christians. Uh, when they tell the story of Jesus coming back from Egypt to, to uh, the land of the Jews, the translator actually writes the land of the Christians. When was this? The 16th century. Um, you must in, write about this. This is very well, important. I'm, I'm just trying to find some, some background in, in medieval and early modern um, uh, literature uh, about this, this substitution and this supersessionism, as, as, as you call this in English, um, trying yeah. to actually... Uh, erase the Jews from the from the New Testament. That would be really some very important work for you to publish. Thank you. I, I, we don't know. I don't know about it. I don't know who's discussed that. There are people who work on on uh, churches in Romania during the Third Reich, and I will also mention. You know, Sibiu. In yep, Romania? yeah, that's where my parents live. Oh, really? It was yes. called Hermannstadt in the Nazi Germany. Absolutely. Nazis well, the this institute that I talked about established a branch in Hermannstadt. Really? Yes. Wow. And I, I can send you information about it. It's, it's in my book, but I'll uh, gladly write to you. I'll why look it up for you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Why don't you email me? I will. I, I'm easy. To, Susanna at Dartmouth.edu. Just Google my name and you'll get, you'll find me. Thank you so much. All right, let's talk about it. Have a good evening. Thank you. Uh, so I see Isaiah Tashima. Yes. Hi. Long time to see. <laughs> Long time. Nice to see you. Yeah, very much. I'm. In, thank you very much for excellent study. Just uh, one question, maybe uh, on side dish. Uh, do you see any uh, mentions or something to say about uh, theologians, Japanese theologians of wartime? Uh, I don't know much about them, but uh, if those uh, Nazi German uh, theologians mentioned about uh, about Japan as allies in terms of anti-Semitism. No, uh, I, I've I've never cross come across a reference. Uh, the only thing that comes to my mind is the uh, the work of the. Japanese novelist Sako Endo, uh, mm. who wrote very movingly uh, mm. about the vivisection 
So mm -hmm. I, I, I met him once. I went to a reading. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I always wished he could meet Ali Wiesel. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I come across the reference to uh, uh, the uh, helpers or assistant to a uh, Japanese uh, Navy uh, officer in uh, uh, Shanghai for refugees, Jewish refugees from uh, Europe. And uh, some uh, may have helped a German uh, consulate to execute their uh, wishes, uh, pressures from uh, Germany. But to somehow it failed in uh, Shanghai and so uh, preserved uh, community in a way. Uh, just uh, that helper may have a strong relationship with uh, uh, Christianity or churches in Japan. And uh -huh. I, I, I have just as curious and as I ha I've been skeptical about uh, the uh, evidence. So if you have some, I thought, uh, mentions or references yeah to, i don't uh, but write to oh, me okay. let's talk about it i, I, I will it. if yeah. i have the time to research on it <laughs> yes where okay. are you located uh, i'm in uh, nara japan you're in and, nara uh, oh with the deer yes yes you know that <laughs> i was there i wish you come someday to japan and uh, lecture on the same topic in to the audience of Japan too. <laughs> that would be nice. Thank you. Say in Thank touch. Thank you. See you. Um, yes, I see Alvaro. Uh, hi, hi, hi. hi. Um, um, thank you so much for this lecture. It, it was very interesting. I have um, uh, something to tell. I'm Colombian. I'm living in Germany, in Stuttgart, uh, since oh. 10 years. I am a musician. And I worked and studied for the Evangelical Church in Germany. Oh. Uh, also, I studied as a church musician. The, uh, the Lutheran Church in Germany had this amazing tradition of music with music of Bach and these composers. And I want to tell you, um, we, we know in, in our education as, uh, uh, as uh, musicians for, for the Evangelical Church about the Beken and the Kirche, about the um, uh, the Christ uh, the, the 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 Deutsche Christen, and so th this kind of themes are in the uh, in the education of pastors and musicians for the uh, evangelical church. I have I I am foreign also in Germany. When I have the sensation uh, when you speak with a native German about the 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 word and about the Holocaust, is actually now today a very difficult tema for the people because they don't want to speak about this terrible past and this terrible uh, um, legacy for, for the people. I, I can't understand the German because they had really a problem. I was as foreign in, in a concentration camp in, near to München in, um, uh, I don't know the name, uh -huh. but it's the how. And it's very impressionant to see the people crying for, for this. Uh, also, I think um, um, German uh, and the Germans had a very difficult relation with this with the past. And I can't understand that. But yeah. it's important to you to know that in Tübingen, uh, that is near to, to, to Stuttgart, in this big um, pastor and evangelical and Catholic church for the church in Germany, this kind of themes about the the Nazis and the Bekin and the Kirche and this uh, and and this role from the from the church is thematized for the new students and the employers for for the evangelical church. I'm glad to hear that. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks for saying that. So um, I think there are no more questions. Um, right. I had one uh, question, yes. just, I, and I'm not for sure if this will be helpful, but, but uh, I want to thank you for being helpful because there's a lot of things that uh, we haven't maybe heard much about what churches were like during this time. And uh, also appreciated you uh, mentioning people like Bonhoeffer who 
did have an impact, but still there was so much there that was missed, uh, missed opportunities by the church. Uh, and, and I say this as a Christian. Uh, tragically, what happened uh, in, in war, leading up to World War II. Um, but I was curious, have you considered the influence of Hegel and his thought that may have in some way impacted or weakened the church and its convictions and witness leading into the 20th century? And I know that's a, that's a really, it's a much deeper matter, but, but, but the question of that dialectic, which also influenced people like Karl Marx, um, and on into, uh, you know, the uh, development of, um, of those theories um, yeah. of Marxism. I'm just curious if, yeah. if you had considered that or, or it's, and it's hard to pinpoint those things in, in, in the state of what was the theology of the churches at the time uh, in the confessing church, as well as the, uh, the other one that had more of an allegiance to Nazism, if you had uh, identified any of that in your studies. Well, that's an interesting question. I have not come across reference to, to Hegel in this material, uh, but that's something I'll think about. I think the person who would know better would be Professor Johannes Zahuber at Oxford University. Uh, it's really more his, uh, his field, Hegel and Schelling and so forth. Uh, yeah, where, where are you calling from? Well, I'm from Green, I'm calling from Green Bay. I'm originally from Virginia, so I'm a I'm in the United States. Uh -huh, Green Bay, Wisconsin. Yes. That's great. Yes. Um, I, I was there once. It's a beautiful town oh. with a wonderful town spirit. Well, I'm, I'm glad you feel that way. I, I feel I the same way. I feel like they've adopted me here. So That's so nice. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Good evening, Professor. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks for the wonderful lecture. I've learned masses of stuff. Um, you've spoken a lot about the, the church, and uh, a few people have made a few comments about <clears throat> the modern church. And somebody from London, I'm also in London, said yeah. he didn't really see it, um, that if, it would, if, if anti Semitism was ever to <sighs> rear its head in that form, in a widespread way again he wouldn't really see it coming out of the church and i've been seeing her whole lecture thinking the church has really changed in in what we now know to be church it's no longer the big organized denominations they're all shriveling and you have mushrooming lots of little churches some of which believe really crazy things some of which are fairly mainstream and i remember about 15 years ago um in a, in a place near Oxford, very quiet, conservative little town, sitting in the church and hearing the pastor say, quote, Israel's lost it, it's now the church. And I looked at my wife and my wife <laughs> looked at me and we thought, hold on, what's this guy just said? Israel's lost it, it's now the church. So I remember um, we went up to him afterwards and said, uh, if God has now shunted Israel aside, that means he's unfaithful. So why have we as Christians got any guarantee that he won't shunt us aside? Either he's faithful or he's not faithful. Can you please explain yourself? And he was unable to explain himself. And my wife and I have, have picked up on comments, little comments like that in all kinds of churches. We've been missionaries in, in like five different countries and I've picked up on comments like that in France, in England, in the States, in Wales, in Poland, in Nigeria. And I just wanted to ask uh, your advice. What do you think could be done to uh, stem the flow of that in the little, the modern little churches? Uh, that's a huge question. And I'm also looking at the clock because I have to teach a class in a few minutes. Um, uh, I'm in the U S and it's just 2 40 PM two forty one PM. I have to, so I don't have time to give you a full answer. And it's something that really is a, 
it's a question that requires a lot of thought. So I can send you an email yes. and ask it. Okay, I'll, I'll wait you. Your Hi, Jeffrey. How are you? Uh, but I see a couple of other uh, good, hands up. Good, thank Jessica you. Jessica and Wolfgang. How's it going? And Yisrael, you need to mute yourself. Good. Yes. I have a, a short question. Is it not yes. possible that the Jews are also Aryans because Avraham came from Ur in Chaldea <laughs> and the Ur in Chaldea seems to be in the region of a mountain Ararat? I, I, I think that these categories of Aryan, Semitic and so forth, these are racist categories. I don't think they have much meaning today. Uh, That's true. Oh, I think this, yeah. it's a joke of uh, um, a bad joke of the world history that um, there the, the ha had been defined Aryans and in the reality, Abraham came from that region. Yes, but that's not something we should concern ourselves with anymore. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you. you very much for your speech. I think Thank we you. have time for one more question, if anyone has a, a question. Jessica has been waiting. Hi. There you go. Can you hear me OK? Yes. OK. <laughs> um, so I I grew up in, in Canada, in Gravenhurst, uh, Ontario. And we had um, a, a prisoner of war camp there called Camp Claydor. And many of the prisoner of wars that were sent to, to North America um, were, were kind of put in the categories and some of the most radical sort of Nazi believers went to this camp. And many moved to the area after the war was finished, after they were sent home. And so we had a lot of, um, uh, uh, a lot of strong believers in Nazism who lived in my town. And so um, um, I guess, um, and even my, uh, my great uncle married a woman who had grown up in Nazi Germany and she had been a strong believer until her dying day. What I was interested in is um, how, um, how was it taught in the schools? Was this carried, were there um, in the curriculum that the children were taught in schools? Was religion um, a, a thing that they studied? in there because it seems to be like it would have tell me again the name of the town gravenhurst ontario gravenhurst it's so interesting all right yeah. so uh the actually the nazis came to power first in thuringia in 1930 uh in the in that region in that state and took over the educational system and what they put through was of course an end to religious education traditional Protestant pastor coming and give religious instruction in the in the public schools, and they actually wrote um, sort of pseudo prayers, etc. Another problem that came up was kids would go to Sunday school or, or for religious education at church, but the Hitler Youth would have its meetings scheduled precisely when religious education was offered, and so they, oh, really, what the Nazis tried to do was to get the kids away from school. Uh, from, from church, excuse me, uh, from religious education and indoctrinate them in, in, in Nazi ideology. But uh, on an overall basis in those days, so in, at least prior to the onset of the war, um, there were very few Germans who withdrew their membership in from the church. So in other words, if you want to leave the church, you have to withdraw your membership. And then your tax dollars wouldn't go there, but you also never had the right to be buried in a churchyard or have a Christian funeral, etc. Very few people did that. Uh, and even some SS officers who would die and have an SS pagan funeral, sometimes the family would have a second Christian funeral service as well. Uh, so the appeal of the Nazi effort to wean people away from Christianity was not as effective as they had hoped, let me put it that way. That's very interesting. Okay, thank you. This lecture has been amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. I appreciate it. Thank you so, once more, Professor. Thanks yeah. everybody for being here. Um, from me, Lalitov from Jerusalem. Lalitov, and thank you so much, Doron. Thank you. Be well. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.